Good morning, folks, and welcome to another action-packed adventure on CPAC Live. It's Friday, for those of you who have forgotten what day it is. I think <laughs> it's the uh, month of April as we approach the end, and we're looking forward toward May, and we're going to bring on our pal and chairman, Matt Schlapp. Matt, how are you on this gloomy Friday here in the swamp? Uh, yeah, gloomy is right. Uh, this is one of those days maybe where you are concerned less uh, that you're in your house because maybe you don't want to be outside. But it's great to be with you, Ian. We've really enjoyed doing this show. We've been coming at you all week at 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I never liked the idea that uh, it seems like all of us who live on the East Coast feel like everyone should know that's the time that things start. I am from Kansas, so I'd much rather be telling you the central time that this starts. How about 1030 central time? But uh, Ian, uh, we've been talking about this with our viewers and as a staff. And uh, next week, we're going to experiment with a new time. We're going to come at you at 330 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because uh, people who live on the West Coast and uh, the, uh, the western part of the country, they want to join us as well. And uh, 1130 is awfully early for them. Plus... Uh, as a, a a proud father of five girls who are in school, uh, are, we are running five schools throughout the day here uh, until about the midpoint of the afternoon. So uh, I have to give my wife, Mercy, the credit for the fact that she's kind of like the uh, homeschooler here. I'm a little less the homeschooler, much less the homeschooler. But uh, so we're going to try to do this when people with young kids or at least school age kids or college age kids are done with most of their work. Um, I want to remind all of our friends out there that we are still doing our daily rosary every evening at 8.15 uh, p.m. for the Catholics who are out there that would like to join us. That's led by Match Lab's brother-in-law out in Kansas. Uh, for our Protestant community, we do the daily prayer at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, and the Jewish prayer call happens every Thursday at 8.45 p.m. If you'd like to join um, any of those sessions, we'd welcome you to be a part of it and reach out to us at CPAC at conservative.org. That's C-P-A-C at conservative.org. I see our board member and friend Kimberly is on with us this morning. Hey, Kimberly, how are you? Hope you're doing well there in the city with our friend Terry. Um, and Matt, you mentioned our friends on the West Coast. I think we've got some West Coast action we want to bring to CPAC Live this morning. Yeah, for sure. Let me just say real quickly, uh, uh, as far as the rosary and the prayer, other prayer services are concerned, all of you should feel free to join. Um, I can't tell you the how many messages I've got from people who might be of a different faith tradition who are joining some of these calls. And I think we all just need to be uplifted. Uh, I think most of us believe that uh, God still has a plan for America. I know I do, and that we're going to get through this. And I know some of us or in the sad position where we have people that have actually been personally hit by this Chinese corona outbreak. And uh, of course, we keep everyone, all the patients in our prayers, including those in our CPAC community. And so, uh, so we're going to go to our first segment here. One of my absolute very favorite people for two reasons is Harmeet Dillon. And Harmeet, I hope you can hear us. Yes. But uh, Harmeet is not only a wonderful human being, an eminent lawyer, uh, but she also educates me on a regular basis as I read her columns and watch her on television. Harmeet has all kinds of super cool titles, but the one that uh, I think she's very proud of is the CEO of the Center for American Liberty, uh, where she's tackling so many of these big legal and constitutional questions that are that's going on in society. Harmeet, great to have you with us. Thank you, Matt. Happy to be here. You look so much better than Ian and I for many reasons. Uh, it looks like you've got a, a, a nice camera and a good setup. So I applaud you. The rest of us are just, it's like we're a garage sale in our house. But uh, you're helping professionalize our outfit. Oh, thank you. What is, uh, okay, so you're from California. Most of us look at what's going on in California and we scratch our heads. Sometimes we get angry. Gavin Newsom's had some kind of actually nice things to say about President Trump's leadership. But then there's some really extreme things going on in these cities. Uh, what's going on out there? Well, maybe it's all the years I've been in politics, but uh, when a politician says very nice things about his enemy, you know that something is up. So right. I'm uh, very distrustful about whatever is, is really the agenda there. Uh, Gavin Newsom has had his eyes on the White House for many years, and so I'm sure he's looking at this as a, 
a kind of an audition or a test run for how he would handle a crisis if he were the president. So overall, I think that uh, the governor, certainly in the first couple of weeks of this situation, was doing something similar that other governors did. California shut down major cities uh, earlier than anywhere else in the country. In the Bay Area where I live, we were shut down, in fact, a couple of days before the governor shut California down. And we've had very low incidence of disease here, relatively speaking, but it is unclear at this point uh, whether that is as a result of other epidemiological factors or whether it is a result of the shutdown. What we have here in California, which I think is of great concern, is uh, a shutdown situation which the governor is threatening to take into the fall and even next year. And that is deeply concerning to people of faith who are being blocked from the ability to worship as they normally right. do. All of us who have businesses and many other aspects of civil society, including elections. So that's definitely something that uh, you know needs to be addressed potentially in the courts very soon. So let's take the first one, which I think is uppermost in the minds of all conservatives who have a skeptical view of the government being ever able to tell us that we have to stay in our homes or stay near our homes. How does a conservative who uh, uh, abides by and adores the Constitution, what's the balance here between what a government entity can tell us we must do for public health and what we're allowed to push back on as individuals? Well, so there are a host of issues. Uh, people are calling me nonstop about masks, about the faith issues, about their businesses being closed, about not even being able to use social distancing in their businesses and voting issues and others. So the basic concept goes back to a Supreme Court case uh, over a century ago called Jacobson. And there's always been this tension between people who have who are resisting vaccination, for example, right. and the rest of us who don't want to die from smallpox or communicable diseases. And so uh, that case established the situation that in an emergency, the government has heightened powers. And um, so the same scrutiny of crackdowns on civil rights does not necessarily apply. Now, one of the problems we're facing in this current crisis is that, you know, quite a few lawyers, not a, maybe a half a dozen lawsuits have been filed around the country, including one lawsuit I filed and another lawsuit I'm about to file regarding this issue. And courts have been all over the place because a century ago, when the United States Supreme Court had that ruling, there was not the incorporation of the Bill of Rights of guarantees in the states. So today, a century later, the states have to obey the same Bill of Rights requirements and however, the different circuit courts have established different tests for that. So for example, we've had disparate, we, and we've had this kind of cut both ways. So for example, in the fifth circuit uh, this, this week, uh, Texas has suspended elective abortions in their state. A district court said that was unconstitutional because it was an infringement on a fundamental right. However, the fifth circuit said using this old Jacobson test, this is an emergency. The government has broad powers. Now, when you take that to California, I had a hearing on Wednesday with the federal court and my challenge to the government's refusing to allow people of faith to be able to worship, socially worship within their houses of worship. And the state, you, the judge used the same uh, case to say, well, this is an emergency and the same constitutional rules do not apply. But in my reading of the law, strict scrutiny should apply to any restriction on faith or speech or assembly or voting or other fundamental rights if the government is not using the least restrictive means possible to achieve its compelling interest. And I think we would all agree, Matt, that it is a compelling interest for the government for people to not be dying in the streets yeah. and uh, having a health crisis. I agree with that. But it is not the least restrictive means possible where I can go as a Californian into a marijuana store, an alcohol store, Walmart, Home Depot, any grocery store, takeout restaurants and laundromats and a few other businesses where the media is allowed to operate without any limitations and where there's no time limitation for being in the Costco or no number of people limitation in any of these places. Why can't we have those same rules in a church, in a large cathedral or a large church why can't people sit six feet apart, wear their masks or, you know, other limitations if necessary and have their services? Why can't a pastor have multiple services in a day, only having a few people in the church at the time if they want? Um, the governor's initial decree was 
it's okay for people of faith to worship only by video conference or telephone. Now, in California with 40 million people in a very large state, many people in our state don't have broadband, so that's not a good answer. And many of us worship in a faith tradition, including my own Sikh tradition, which involves people coming together in some way. But I will say that the court and actually the state of California in response to our lawsuit has allowed drive-in services for people of faith in any tradition. So that's a victory. But we're going to continue fighting on this issue, Matt, because worship is, of course, even more important to people of faith right now than it would be in normal times. You're watching CPAC Live with Harmeet Dillon, the CEO for the Center for American Liberty. Harmeet, as you look across the country and see the various responses from states and, uh, and, and local municipalities. Who do you think is doing a good job uh, out there about striking that appropriate balance between the, uh, the health concerns and then the economic fallout? Well, it seems to me that Florida is doing a pretty good job and, it, uh, and you know, Florida is not applying a one size fits all approach. So if there's a recognition that in dense urban areas, one type of approach may be necessary, whereas Beaches are being opened up in areas where there is less incidence of disease. Uh, as we are beginning to learn more about this disease, we are learning that sunlight kills the disease, uh, that the disease is not necessarily communicated or communicable in an outdoor setting when people aren't right next to each other. And so uh, the, the Governor DeSantis is allowing more liberty. Uh, Governor Kemp in Georgia is allowing certain business establishments that are important uh, to people hair salons, restaurants to open up if they're engaging in social distancing. So we're going to see the results of that. I think it's early to say. But um, the other thing to recognize, and I think we're going to learn a lot more about this disease, is that it's very prevalent in these dense urban areas of New York and uh, New Jersey. But we have uh, dense urban areas in California, San Francisco, uh, San Jose, Los Angeles, where it is not uh, particularly uh, high incidence of morbidity or mortality. I think that the incidence of people who've been sick with this disease we're showing is being greatly undercounted. And so the mortality rate is artificially inflated. So uh, the more we learn, the more people can adjust. And I think governors are acting in good faith to a certain degree, but there is a political element to it as well. Uh, we have an election this year uh, and we are of course having governors tell us we're not gonna be able to operate. Um, we have businesses uh, being killed right now every day, including law firms, the industry that I'm in. And uh, I think the government, in some cases, Democrats uh, like uh, like us to be dependent on welfare and handouts, and 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 I don't like that, and no conservative likes that. So so we have to begin asking some hard questions as conservatives on on behalf of our liberty, because if we give it up in this circumstance, this will not be the last crisis that America faces. But even in the Supreme, even in the Civil War where uh, you know, there was a temporary suspension of habeas corpus, eventually, even in a civil war, uh, they had to reopen the courts and they had to allow normal rights to occur. And we have to allow that as soon as possible here in America. You uh, mentioned a moment ago, the ability of people to be able to practice uh, their faith. Uh, it's obviously an underpinning of the founding of America and it's an issue critically important to our conservative allies, this notion that you can practice how you'd like to practice, when you'd like to practice. A lot of us are watching services on television since we've been uh, forced to stay uh, at home. This question comes from uh, our friend Jeff Dunnitz. Is there a legal distinction between banning people from going to church and then banning people from showing up in their cars and keeping their windows closed for some of these outdoor services that, uh, that uh, houses of worship have begun to implement as part of their, uh, uh, their practice? Well, you know, the governor would say, as he did of California at the beginning of this process, that no services in person are permitted. And then when I filed a lawsuit, the governor rolled back his position and he claimed that by allowing technological church services, he was allowing driving, because driving is technology. I think that's, that's kind of silly. Uh, that kind of shows how some of these broad, sweeping, arbitrary rules are being misinterpreted by local officials. But up until the time that the governor said that in court, in his filing, uh, people were being ticketed. Pastors were being ticketed and fined and subject to criminal penalties for holding drive-in services. So, um, so that's being permitted and that's better than having to stay at home, in my opinion. At least you can see your fellow uh, men and women in the cars. You can hear, you can see a human being. It's the human contact that we crave as part of our worship that is very reinforcing and that is across many faiths. 
as you know, as we know, our friends in the Jewish faith have a tradition in the Orthodox faith where they they can't drive or they can't use a Wi-Fi to have a service. They have to be able to walk to their service and they have to be able to have 10 people gathering. There has been no consideration of that really in the uh, the governor's orders. And so we will be fighting a lawsuit. Uh, we'll be fighting our lawsuit. There was another lawsuit filed yesterday in Lodi. Great uh, to have Harmeet on. Excellent. She's a brilliant lawyer. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about this new venture that she's talking about, because to me, these questions of our civil liberties and freedom are foremost uh, in everybody's heads, which is what can Governor Northam tell me I must do? And what should I kind of allow Governor, Governor Northam in Virginia to speak about in the interests of public safety? We're all trying to balance that out. He's not my favorite politician, might be my least favorite politician. By the way, Gavin Newsom might be in the top three of my least favorite politicians. Governor Cuomo would be right up there. But there are things that maybe that it's okay that the, the government does. And what I like it when I hear from them is them giving their viewpoint on what are the safest health practices uh, that people should undertake and allowing the individual to have wide latitude in what he or she decides to do. I don't know, does that ring true to you, Ian? It, it does. Um, it, what, what we're up against, though, in addition to this health crisis, in addition to the, the fallout that I want to ask you about before we uh, bring on our next guest, Gordon Chang, is, is, is I'm becoming very nervous that progressive politicians, Matt, are going to use this moment and are already actively using this moment to fundamentally transform the nature of what it means to be an American, to fundamentally right. transform uh, our economy, are going to leverage this all the way up until November. You've got AOC running around there telling people don't go back to work until we become a socialist America. You should refuse to come out of your house uh, uh, as, a, as a state of protest. You don't need to pay your rent. You don't need to uh, do all of these things that, that we've done. We're headed toward free college. This is really the Green New Deal that they're trying to get implemented. You see the way Pelosi and Schumer are holding up every little thing to try to get passed, put into these bills, uh, uh, the wish list of things that they wouldn't be able to get passed uh, in normal circumstances. Is this becoming a greater concern to you what the American left is doing at this point? Yeah, I think that they always say don't let an emergency go to waste and they're going to cram through all the government spending, all the federal government mandates they ever dreamed of. Now, the other side of this is we're all living the Green New Deal, Ian. You know why? Because you're not firing up your truck. Uh, we're not jumping on planes. Uh, we're not even getting on trains. And they th thought trains were okay, by the way, because I don't know why liberals just love trains, but they do. But the uh, so we we're kind of living this life of the Green New Deal. The only difference is Gas is two bucks a gallon. They want it to be 20 bucks a gallon. And that's why you wouldn't be firing up your truck because you wouldn't be able to fill it up or afford to fill it up very often. Um, you know, and I think the Green New Deal, this version of it sucks. I'd want to be able to get in my car, get on a plane, go and do things, buy things. And uh, there's some versions of, of some extreme ideologies that kind of like the idea maybe that the American economy is shut down and maybe they feel like we're doing less polluting or whatever. But the, uh, so you can kind of see we're getting, we're getting a simulated version of what, it, uh, of what some people's idea of environmental and economic nirvana is. And, uh, and so I, I have a contrary view, which is I think America is not America when we're not out there all doing stuff, including a balanced approach to using fossil fuels to create uh, our own version of happiness, the pursuit of happiness, and our own economic activity. So yeah, this is a blue, red, real contrast. And Ian, you said something to me last week when, when you said, you know, this is a time when we need to be behind each other and at each other's back, not at each other's necks. And I think it's sad that it, you can see such a strident difference between where blue commentators view that the government must tell everyone they must behave in this way and more red commentators, conservative commentators who are like, look, the government can't trample on all of our rights. If someone feels the need to be in a church to pray because they feel desperation or they just want to give thanks to their uh, creator, you can't discount that just because that's not important to you, blue state governor. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a sad, it's a sad moment in many ways. A uh, quick hello to our friend Dahlia Al-Akidi. 
uh, who's watching in Minnesota, who is running against Ilhan Omar. Nicole Good Sakurai, luck. Nicole Sakurai from Japan uh, is on. Bernadette uh, says she likes Matt's beard. All uh, right. Our, Way to go, Bernadette. Fellow uh, board member Ron Robinson from YAF uh, is, is watching. Hey, Ron, good to hear from you. Super volunteer Britta out there Britta. in either Colorado good lady. Uh, or New Mexico. Uh, Matt, any, uh, any last words before we bring on um, Gordon Chang? What should people be thinking about as we go through this weekend? We don't even remember that it's the weekend anymore. What should we <laughs> yeah. be looking for as we head into next week? Look, I think as we head into next week, we have this whole question about the responsible way to get as much of the economy opened up uh, as we possibly can and preparing for that. And quite honestly, for all the conservatives who are listening, this constitutional showdown, which is inevitable, where uh, more centralized, autocratic, uh, blue city, blue state government officials telling you what you must do, and uh, the president of the United States saying there's a balanced and, and healthy and responsible way to get as many of us back to work. I want everyone to think about a couple things. If you go to Target or Walmart or Home Depot or Safeway or you know whatever your food chain is uh, to get the provisions you must get or that you can't get online, if you think of Federal Express or UPS or the United States Postal Service, most of those businesses are running full tilt including some of the private companies that take care of our national security. They're running full tilt. Policemen, firemen, first responders, hospital workers, they're running full tilt. They're able to do that in a safe way. Yes, we've all read tragic stories about some people have gotten sick and some people have died and nobody likes the idea that anybody dies of this virus. But if they're able to do that in a responsible way, are there more companies that can do that in a responsible way? That's the question before all of us as a society. Yes, maybe we'll have to change some of our habits forever, but one of those habits we cannot afford to change forever is the idea that no one can go to work. Because if that happens, in real essence, America ceases to be America. And I also think Americans will become, um, you know, uh, I think it'll be a meager, it'll be a nasty, brutish, and short existence, to quote a famous philosopher, because we won't be able to kind of shine the light uh, that makes each one of our individual lights so, uh, lives so special. So this is the moment that's going to be before our society. So as we head into next week, let's listen to smart people like Harmeet Dillon and our next guest and make up our own minds. I think that's the right attitude. Thank you, Matt Schlapp, for those words of wisdom. Folks, uh, give us about a minute and we're going to bring on our friend Gordon Chang to answer your questions here on CPAC Live. I would like to talk with you this evening about what we can do together to make tomorrow's America happy and prosperous at home strong and respected abroad, and at peace in the world. We will restore the freedom of all men and women to excel and to create. We will unleash the energy and genius of the American people, traits which have never failed us. We can create the incentives which take advantage of the genius of our economic system. There is news tonight of another threat to America's economy and security, cyber attacks. China is stealing intellectual property by hacking into computer networks of U.S. companies. Chinese hackers are also blamed for attacks on large information systems, including Google's networks. China unleashing its full spy power on American power grids and the wealth of American manufacturing. China striking at the heart of our economy. Iconic American companies like Ford and Google, the Pentagon, too. Reliable estimates put the loss at more than $100 billion a year. I'll set up this first question while we get um, Gordon's camera working. Um, earlier this week on Tucker Carlson's show, he had on um, a former executive from a company called McKinsey and Company. For those of you 
who uh, are unfamiliar with uh, McKinsey. They are a management um, consulting firm um, who have been responsible in a lot of people's minds of outsourcing American jobs, have a profound influence on a lot of American businesses and their relationship with China. Um, this uh, executive, uh, Mr. Walker, has written a book called Powerful, Different, and Equal that was praised by the Chinese Communist government. Um, he has praised the Chinese Communist response to coronavirus. Uh, Gordon Chang, there you are. It's so nice to see you and to be able to give our uh, attendees a chance to interact with you. We were setting up this uh, topic from Tucker Carlson earlier this week, uh, who had a former executive from the McKinsey Company. And this is an American company that uh, it sounds like is operating in cahoots with the Chinese Communist Party, spreading um, uh, propaganda about how fantastic their response was and how slow and half-hearted uh, the American response to uh, the Wuhan virus was. What would your thoughts be on American companies who seem to be doing the bidding of, uh, of, of the Chinese Communist Party rather than looking after American interests? Well, thank you, Ian and, and Matt. Uh, Ian, this is just repulsive. Um, but on the other hand, it is legal. And what we really need to do is if companies don't exercise the discretion that they should, because we've got to remember that China has just attacked us. We've now lost 50,000 Americans. If countries don't use discretion, then we, the president has got to use his emergency powers to get these companies off Chinese soil. Because the comments that we have heard from McKinsey and others really, I think, are directed to try to curry favor with Beijing because they realize that if they do that, they'll have business opportunities. So really, this is going to be, I think, an issue of the president using his emergency authority under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977, also uh, the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, and other powers that he possesses. There's an interesting wrestling match going on. You have been so clear in a lot of your uh, appearances that I've seen um, that we need to highlight the response from Chinese officials happening in China. I woke up this morning and it seems like what the Chinese propagandists would like us to talk about is to consider this conspiracy theory that uh, that the origins of, of, of Chinese corona were actually here in the United States or something. They seem reluctant to talk about their response. It's, they've thrown out the journalists. It's difficult to get accurate reporting about how they did respond. Um, how are we gonna keep the fire on people talking about uh, uh, their response rather than these conspiracy theories saying that somehow we were the source of the origin? Yeah, we need to continue to propagate truth. Um, and the truth is that the science says that this virus accidentally escaped from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is a high level biosafety lab uh, just 20 miles south of the center of Wuhan. Um, Beijing tries to give us the, the narrative, oh, this was just a natural mutation at a wet market in Wuhan from a bat. Um, clearly, uh, that's not the case because The Lancet, which is that authoritative British medical journal uh, on January 24th, posted an article which said that many of the initial coronavirus cases had nothing to do with that wet market. Um, and we have learned a lot about the failure of the Wuhan Institute of Virology to meet the safety protocols and standards that are absolutely necessary for the type of dangerous work that they do. But Ian, Wherever, however this virus started, we, there are a couple of facts that we need to get on the table. And that is that uh, it was only on January 20 that Chinese leaders admitted to the world that the coronavirus was human to human transmissible, age to age. But doctors in Wuhan knew that it was being transmitted from one person to the next in the second week of December. Uh, so Chinese leaders had to know about it, oh, maybe a few days later. Um, now, if Beijing had said nothing about H to H um, for five and a half, six weeks, that would have been dangerously irresponsible. But it's even worse because Chinese leaders tried to convince the world that it was not human to human transmissible. And that means uh, health authorities around the world were lulled into taking, not taking all sorts of actions that they would have. And Chinese leaders 
while they knew that this was human to human transmissible, they tried to pressure countries not to impose travel restrictions and quarantines on arrivals from China. Um, and that was the January 10th statement from the uh, World Health Organization. And it was also a number of statements from China itself. So you put these two things together. Chinese leaders knew that this was highly contagious. They also tried to get countries to accept arrivals from China. Now, if you're Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, and having seen what coronavirus did to cripple your country, if you wanted to level the geopolitical pl level field, playing field by spreading this virus to other countries so they would also get sick, well, Ian, you would have done exactly what Xi Jinping did which means that there's really only one explanation that fits the facts and that this is, is either a reckless or a malicious spread of the disease to the rest of the world. This is the first time in human history that one nation has attacked all other nations at the same time. That's scary stuff. And I think that there are good reports out there saying that since January 1st of 2020, that the United States has absorbed close to 400,000 um, uh, citizens from China to come over here uh, with uh, that government's blessing. Um, let me, and of course, you can always go to conservative.org and look at all of the great content that Gordon has produced over the years from our CPAC stage. We've got a special section there just on China if you'd like to do a deeper dive. And I highly encourage all of our activists to go and take a look at all of those panels going back to 2016, uh, where Gordon was letting all of us know. Uh, uh, where this relationship uh, go, go sour uh, before it was headed in this direction. Um, Jasmine Hauser asks, I went to Gordon Chang's breakout sessions at CPAC and was stunned by what I learned. She asked, my parents were born and raised in Ecuador in South America. And I understand China is now in 17 countries in Latin and South America, including Ecuador holds over $137 billion of debt using the natural resources of these countries in the Western Hemisphere as collateral as part of their One Belt Road initiative for worldwide hegemony. Is that right? And what's the end game here? Why are the Chinese communists so uh, uh, pers persevering so to get their fingers into so many nations around the world, Gordon? Yeah, China since 2013 has two initiatives, One Belt, One Road, which has been combined into the Belt and Road Initiative which is basically to build infrastructure around the world to tie trade routes to China. And it started initially just between China and Europe, but now it's been expanded, um, as she mentioned, to Latin America. And we Americans got to remember that the Chinese are now spending something like $3.4 billion or so on um, a container port um, in Freeport in the Grand Bahama Island which is just about 87 miles east of Palm Beach. So we can expect that the Chinese Navy will eventually show up within 100 miles of our shore. This has since been expanded, this Belt and Road Initiative, to a digital Silk Road, which is trying to wire the world to China. And most recently, in mid-March, a health Silk Road. Um, and so China has tried to use um, diplomacy by giving away generous items like mask gowns, the rest of it, but many of them are defective. Um, the worst incident was that uh, Italy had donated protective equipment to China and China then turned around within a couple of weeks selling it back to Italy. Um, there, there's just been so many of these incidents recently which show um, the maliciousness of the Chinese regime um, throughout this whole coronavirus incident. But clearly what they're trying to do with Belt and Road and with their other initiatives is to dominate the world. Because one other thing, Ian, this sounds ludicrous, um, but Xi Jinping believes that China is the world's only sovereign state, that he's the world's only legitimate ruler. That makes the United States, in addition to other countries, vassals or subjects of a greater Chinese court. And all that Xi Jinping has been doing is really in connection with that goal. I know it's audacious. I know that we Americans have a hard time accepting that, that one leader could think that way. But unfortunately, that's the way he's been talking. And he has been doing his best to make sure that no other nation has sovereignty. Uh, if you uh, expect the way they treat their, uh, their own country's people, 
uh, the treatment that they receive there with the human rights abuses that have been well known for years. That's how they'd like to treat a lot of their partners around the globe, it seems like. I'm going to combine two questions, one from Grizzly Joe, our friend, and Beverly Berger. Um, and there are a lot of folks who would like to consider, Americans, who say, what, what can I do? And whether it's feasible to uh, um, live in a world with our own consuming habits of not buying any Chinese products anymore, to hit them where it hurts in their own pocketbook. Uh, but Grizzly asks, how much supply chain manufacturing activities can we really pull from China without them escalating, becoming uh, belligerent? Do you have hope that our elected officials and companies will get us out of China manufacturing our critical products and especially pharmaceuticals? Yeah, pharmaceuticals are our number one vulnerability because depending on who's counting, somewhere between 80 to 97 percent of our antibiotics are manufactured in China. Um, and so that right now is, is where China has enormous leverage over the U.S., um, but the president is considering an executive order on supply chain robustness, which would force um, some of that manufacturing back within our own borders. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, trade groups are, are opposing it, um, but this is something that we absolutely have to do. We know that the administration wants to give incentives to companies to get their facilities off Chinese soil. So, for instance, two weeks ago, Larry Kudlow, um, who uh, is the president's number one economic advisor, actually talked about giving American companies 100 percent write offs for removing facilities from China. And that's absolutely what we have to do. You know, also, we need bottom up pressure, as those questions suggest. We just need consumers not to buy stuff from China. Now, the big box stores, you know, um, TJ Maxx, Target, Walmart, they're firmly committed to China. Um, but they wouldn't be that way if their consumers um, felt, no, we're just not going to buy that stuff. We have, uh, I think, a task which is both bottom up and also top down um, to get companies to move off of China. And, and also part of it is, is going to happen anyway, because China is an unreliable member of global supply chains for a lot of reasons. Companies on their own or given push by President Trump's tariffs are, are actually getting their facilities into other places, um, into Vietnam, into Taiwan, into even the United States. Uh, Gordon, we've got one more question for you before we let you go. And thank you for joining us, friends. Follow Gordon on Twitter at Gordon G. Chang. Follow Gordon on Twitter at Gordon G. Chang. Our friend Annie Chan asks, uh, Gordon, why do our enemies always seem to attack New York? Is there something about New York that's that's special as far as it being uh, uh, the receptacle for a lot of international uh, uh, espionage and attacks? Well, um, New York is, is critical um, because that's where the global financial community is centered. Um, you know, the U.S. dollar um, reigns supreme. Uh, China and Russia would like to dethrone the dollar, um, but they're not having any success in doing it. So, for instance, international usage of the RMB has been going down recently. It's in the low single digits, 1%, 2%. People want the dollar because they trust the United States. Um, and the home of the dollar, um, in many ways, is, is New York. Um, so that, that's important for the U.S. Um, because we derive a lot of benefits from um, the dollar being the world's reserve currency. And so, for instance, um, if Iran does things which are really dangerous, we can use dollar sanctions to force Iran to do things that they otherwise might not want to. So um, that's why New York is, is absolutely so critical. And, I, you know, you have to think about uh, the plight that the city is in. Um, and, and that is actually just driving a lot of the decisions in the United States these days. Um, because it is so central to the U.S. economy and to the global financial system. Gordon, you've done such a good job over the years uh, about making me smarter, about making so many of us who attend CPAC uh, think about things in the right way. Uh, thank goodness you do it. Every time you appear on one of our shows, on one of our stages, our collective IQ go up uh, about 10 points. Um, so thank you for doing what you do. We're going to continue to uh, watch you on Twitter and watch you on television and hope to have you back here on the CPAC Live show 
very soon. Remember, folks, next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're going to move to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Next week, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We thank you so much for joining us. And if you've got something that you'd like us to consider or talk about on the show, you can always reach out to us at CPAC at conservative.org. That's C-P-A-C at conservative.org. Have a great weekend, folks, and we look forward to seeing you next Monday. Bye for now.